Lord, this morning we remember those in this country, in Lebanon, in Syria, in France, and in other places around the world. who feel the power of pain and the loss and the grief that comes from senseless violence. Lord, have mercy upon our world. Have mercy upon us as human beings and help us, O oh Lord, to be able to see the light and to be able to find a new path. Oh, Lord, for those who are shaken, for those who are traumatized, for, Lord, those who are crying, help them through their grief and give comfort and strength to all. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lavina lost her sister this week. And <coughs> Lavina, will you just raise your hand? And so if we could remember Lavina, she travels in a while to Antigua to mourn her sister's passing. And so, Lavina, we offer your prayers and our sympathy. Then anybody has ever been new on a job? What are your thoughts when you are new? Robert said to me this morning, how am I doing? <laughs> so can you give him a little applause to let him know? Right, because to do well, you just need a little encouragement. You need, uh, so if they're frowning, it's not at you. It's, 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 it's not at you. Today's parable is a portion in scripture that almost everybody knows. We call it the parable of the good uh, Samaritan. Can I suggest to you that that's not the right title? There is an assumption that Samaritans are not good. What if you heard it this way that those women, the good woman, what does that mean? All the other women are bad. I found one. I found a good woman, but in principle, they're not good. Or are they a good black person? The intelligent, the skilled, the talented one, because all the others are not really so. I believe that if you, if you read this passage from the perspective of somebody who thought they were superior, then maybe you think that the Samaritan was lesser. But when you read this text, it is a marvelous inverted text because the assumption when you read this passage and when you see the initial encounter between Jesus and this lawyer was that surely the Jewish people knew what was right and they had it going on. And Jesus does something radical is that he takes the parable and he turns the order upside down. Let me take you a little closer. 
in the days of the time when the parable was written, societies were strongly tribal. You identified with your people and your God. So the Jews of Judah and Galilee thought that they were better than the Samaritans. Number one, they worshipped in Jerusalem, which was the only right place to worship. And they also were pure-blooded Jews. The Samaritans thought they were Jews, but they were, according to the Jewish population, they were not really Jews. Being a good Jew meant that you were righteous. Being a good Jew meant that you were justified. Being a good Jew meant that you would know how to do the right thing. We were here first. So Jesus tells this inverted story about a traveler who is waylaid by bandits, about a traveler who is left for dead by his countrymen, and that the clergy passed by, but the clergy were too busy or concerned about some other priorities so they couldn't stop to help. Only a Samaritan who had no reason to help his enemy stopped. To help. Maybe Jesus was telling us something about our assumptions. Don't ever assume that the right people are always inside of the building. Don't assume that the right people are on top of the pulpit speaking to you. Don't assume that the, the right people are the ones who have uh, the right nationality or the right accent or the right culture or the right color or the right creed. Maybe Jesus is suggesting something to us. A contemporary writer took the story and framed it this way. Let me here, if it makes a little more sense to somebody. It says, now it came to pass a certain man was traveling lonesome street, a lonely and dark road from Tom's Tavern to Bill's Bar. After many visits to this bar, the consumption of liquor got a hold of him, stripped him of all his goods, and left him destitute and dying on Skid Row. There came a respected bishop. The bishop saw that the man was drunk with a bleeding skull and he had vomit all over his clothes. So the bishop decided he was too drunk to talk to and felt that society should do something about bums like him. So he passed by on the right and as fast as possible. Soon a social worker whose training taught her how to care for persons with all kinds of social and personal problems came that way. She saw the man stretched out on the sidewalk, looked at him, but concluded that the man was beyond help or hope. She straightway continued on her way. After a while, a dreadlock came down lonesome, lonesome street. Respectable people don't like dreadlocks with their nappy, long, sometimes unwashed hair. Dreadlocks are watched with suspicion by the police. But the dreadlocks saw the dying drunk. He came where he was, 
call a fellow dreadlock to help him. Spoke soothing words, lifted the man in his arms, took him to a place where he knew the man would receive care. And he said, you can count on me. I will be back tomorrow. Whether you like the old version or the contemporary version, Jesus asked a pointed question. Who was neighbor to the man? Every opportunity to do good should count. Every opportunity to do good should count. Those of us who want to walk the path of faith should ask always, am I living the expected path or am I willing to go on the unusual path so that I can experience the extraordinary. If you think about it, it is always legitimate to say I was busy. It's always legitimate to say I just can't do it. God sent this man to be able to cure for this wounded, beaten stranger. He sent him with an opportunity that he needed to seize. You would say this is a can't miss opportunity and yet two others passed by this man on the road and they chose to miss it. How many times have you and I passed the other side to escape the discomfort of the undesirable. How many times have we not heard the cries of the half-dead person, help me? Will somebody help me? I wonder how many times even when we are here in worship with one another, we are being open to hearing the cries of our brothers and sisters, I need you. The story and the power of this story is that the Samaritan was not focused upon what he knew. The Samaritan was focused on what he could see. Many times our problems isn't knowing what we should or shouldn't do. Many times our problems is having the vision to see someone else not as a burden, but as our neighbor and to recognize in their face the face of God. Look on the person who is beside you or near you. Look at them. If you can't look at them, look at me. <laughs> Hopefully, you will see the face of God as you look on the other person. Many times we say, Lord, we don't have enough information. We need more teaching. We need more Bible study. And God says, it is not that you need more instructions or you need more coaching. Many times what you need is an eye transplant. So that with new eyes, you can see others as God sees them. You can see the child of God, the loving person around you. And we live in a world today 
when the major religions in our, in our world teach hate, people believe it's okay to kill because if my God wins and your God loses, then we have done justice to God. If I get raised up and I diminish you, we have done well. Conservative Christianity, conservative Judaism, conservative Islam builds walls, takes weapons, does extraordinary things to hurt other people. And all of us should be able to name it. And say, Lord, when have I been like that? Usually, there is somebody who you worship with or somebody you meet that you don't like. Sometimes, like moves to I really don't like. Sometimes it escalates to, I can't stand them. And then eventually it gets to, they don't belong here. Well, part of that was going on on this road from Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho. He is wounded. But who cares? Something happened in the Samaritan, which, which, which tells me something about the Samaritan and about how God had engaged the Samaritan and about how the Samaritan had been raised because when he saw the wounded man on the ground, the scripture, according to the Revised Standard Version, said he was moved. Something at the core of him transcended nationality, culture, religion, and he suffered with the man. And then he said, I have to do something. You see, if he thought of himself as the bad Samaritan, or the worthless Samaritan, or the incapable Samaritan, then he would have said, I have no power to do anything. I just have to leave him because I am not competent or capable. But that's not what he did. He claimed the power that God had given to him. He claimed the compassion that God had given to him, and he says, I am going to do something. Brother, your best day happened when you met me, because now I will walk with you. During the past week, On the Missouri, the University of Missouri campus, students affirmed that they don't, that they're real legitimate students of the campus. That's what the students did, the black students and those who supported them did. We belong here. We are qualified, educated. We came here to improve our lives. We came here and we want to be loved and respected and treated with dignity like any other human being. We belong here. It is an unusual moment in America when a group of students cause a college president to resign. But you think that's the big story? The big story was when the football players 
back by their coach, decided we want to be respected and treated a certain way. Let me help you. On most college campuses in America, the football coach earns more than the president. Because football brings in millions of dollars to the campus. This particular coach, after standing with his students, he resigned yesterday. No doubt under pressure from people who said, if you stand with the black students, you can no longer be coach here. For God's children to have a new day, each of us have to be able to recognize that we should work for a world that's better than what it is today. And that every single one of us has power and influence to be able to change the way things are conducted and to demand respect and dignity and to portray respect and dignity in the way we lift each other. The story of the Samaritan and the stranger who was on that road from Jerusalem to Jericho is a story we meet all the time. How many times during the last week you have had the opportunity to help somebody and your calculations have been, is it safe? Is it good? If I do this, what's going to happen in return? And many of us have the argument in our brains, and after a while, we argue it so much that we become immobilized. Or have you ever gone for your purse or your wallet, but while the argument is happening, the person just moves on because you weren't really ready? To help them. The priest, the Levite, members of this traveler's group had right religion, but they didn't have compassion. They had access to God but they didn't care for their neighbor. On April 80, 18, 2010, right here in Jamaica, Queens, a Guatemalan immigrant, Hugo Alfredo Tale Yak, came to the aid of a woman who was being threatened by a man wielding a knife. Tele Yak struggled with the attacker, and eventually the attacker stabbed him and left him to die on the streets of Jamaica. The woman and the attacker fled in different directions while he lay, lay bleeding on the ground. The NYPD had video surveillance of the street. And when they rolled the film of what happened on the street, the camera shows that one man came and looked upon Hugo Alfredo Taleyak, and they took a picture of him with his cell phone. That 18 other people saw or walked right past him, but all refused to render or contact authorities. Nobody called 911 or 411 or any 11. The closest anyone came to help 
was a man who shook the body vigorously. But when he saw blood, he walked away. When the firefighters arrived 15 minutes later, Hugo was dead. When God allows us to walk the journey of life, how do you look and respond to people? Everybody in this room has a chance to have impact on somebody's life. Everybody in this room has the chance to make a difference in somebody's situation. Everybody in this room has the chance to do something tremendous for others. Usually, to be able to empower and to lift someone who is broken and fallen, it means you got to come by them. You got to identify with them. You got to walk with them. You got to go the extra mile with them. The scripture says that it only works when we spend time being thankful for people. Anybody you're thankful for, you are able to bring worth and dignity and pride and a lot of good things to their life. Anybody you're thankful for, you are also able to do something else you're able to be thoughtful for them. There's a woman who brings me bananas. And I thought, well, the bananas didn't show up here. All week she's preparing, I'm told, to bring me bananas. She thought about it. In this congregation in which we worship, we represent both the best and the worst of the world. We represent the fact that in tremendous diversity when people come together, they can do great things or we could all be in our little groups or cliques and never ever grow or learn from each other. I want to challenge you this morning as a response to the sermon to find five people who you don't normally connect with. And this is what I want you to do. Find five people, and during the week you're going to be praying for the people, which means you're going to be thankful for them. They have a story. They have a journey. There is something in their life that's happening, and you are going to, when you go for your personal prayers to God, you're going to say, Lord, I am thankful for these folks. And then you're going to be thoughtful for them. Think about something that you could do to help to make or influence their life. You either pass by this moment or you stop and find five people. So can I challenge you, those who would like to lift up five people in prayer, and say to five people, I'm committed to connecting with you and raising you up through my prayer experience and through my thoughts. I'd like to get your name. Just leave your seats and go to where people are. And as you go to where people are, say, I'm committed to having an impact for good in your life. You need a pencil or a paper, you will need to be able to write something. Write five names. 
find five people. So everybody got the idea, right? That if you affirm my worth, and you can be thankful to God for me, and pray for me, then the likelihood you will treat me better, and I will treat you better too. Jesus ended by asking the lawyer who was neighbor, the Samaritan. He says, go and do likewise. Let us pray. Lord, here are we, your children. Give us new eyes for each other. Give us the ability to see and hear each other in new and fresh ways. And Lord, we look forward to the testimonies of what you have done because we stopped by the pew to talk and to really connect, that we stop by the side of the road, that we truly made the effort to go deeper in our relationships. Bless all of us and help us to excel in our journey with you. In Jesus' name, amen.